that's no moon. Well, well, well. It seems that just as the game looks like they're wrapping up. No, they're still rolling and wrapping, but this game... He's still trying. He's trying. <laughs> but, but as... Not it's, looking it's, great. It's, 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 it's hard. But uh, in the meantime, we're joined. Will Schick. Hello. Thank you How for joining you, us. Sir? Hi, uh, Will. So, but I'm Cockles. This is John and Zane. Um, yeah, welcome to this get to the stream. Um, what we've got here, just tell you what's going on. Mm -hmm. Mateusz from Poland has come all the way from Poland in the last chance qualifier to get his ticket. Ooh. He's a good player, but he comes over to the UK and he does well. <laughs> uh, Richard has been fighting an uphill battle, losing his dark troopers mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. a cav tank. Fairly early. Very I think early. Like round Ooh. three, yeah. they went down. That's not what you want to have happen. No. no. And no. it was only one unit of dark troopers, too, so his firepower went down the gutter. Mm. Yeah. It's like half after. his army points in within two, within, within turn. Yeah. Because yeah, he lost his tank oh. first. Oh, yeah. In yeah. round one or two. But there we go. But, Will, you're here to join us. Uh, you I mean, have this joined just us, proves so. that whenever the Empire fights the Empire, nobody wins. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. They've just wrapped, and that is the game done. Um, Mateos now takes it 2-0, and, and unlucky Richards on that one. Uh, Zen's going to go just get some final info. He's going to give them their prize tickets. By the way, mm. those prize tickets, I had a little venture around earlier. <laughs> Bravo, sir. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> you can get some choice things with those, oh, right? Yeah. Like, are, it's not too yeah. bad. They're really cool. It's not too bad of an arcade prize wall for people. So, for the context, Will, you've joined us. Tell us, uh, for people who don't know who you are because they may not know, yeah, uh, yeah. who are you what, and what do you do, please? Uh, so, my name is Will Schick. I am the... Uh, oh my gosh, it's day one of the convention. I've forgotten what I do. Uh, I <laughs> am the right. director of product development for Atomic Mass Games, nice. um, which effectively means that I oversee all of the creative departments for the game development, uh, sculpting, painting, artwork, all that. It's my job to kind of provide the cohesive vision, yep. do the long-term product planning and release scheduling, and then work with those teams to execute it. Awesome. Um, okay. So I get to work with a lot of really talented people and uh, tell them what to do. Sweet. Nice. What, you've been here, do you want to yesterday or today? Because I saw Will, other Will. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, so we, we got in, I got in on Tuesday night, so we were here all day for setup yesterday, getting everything like built for the prize wall and for the little HQ setups and then our exhibit hall. Yep. And then um, I got to watch as all these glorious tables went up. So I've been here, I haven't been here too, too long. Um, Dallas and a couple of other people got in on Monday, so they've been here for the whole week. Awesome. And what are your sort of your overall impressions of Adepticon as a whole? Oh, I love Adepticon. I mean, every year I think it can't get any bigger or can't get any more spectacle, and like it always does, right? Um, just the fact that we've, you know, we've we've seen the player grow so much. We have the largest, as far I was I was told, so far we have the largest uh, Legion tournament happening tomorrow with round yeah. one of the Worlds events. Uh, it's going to be 14 hours of nonstop Legion action. Let's do this. Uh, I can't wait. Whew. I mean, that is an event right there. Um, so uh, we just we have, yeah, it's it's been wild and crazy to just watch everything. And like Hank's team and the Adepticon staff, they do such an incredible. Like every year, you come and there's new terrain, there's new tables, there's new like so. Yeah, it's it's been it's been amazing. I I love Adepticon. I love seeing where it's going. Oh, now we're on camera. Look at me. Yeah, he Hi. threw us on camera. <laughs> There he is. And then I'm hiding John, behind John's the, literally, John's the under big the monitor. He's just under there. Yeah, he's right. just a monitor. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> you just, been his job you just <laughs> peer out, you know? <laughs> John, after you, you got the next one? Uh, yeah, so have you been able to watch many of the Legion games yet? Or any you know, games to be fair as well. I honestly have not. Um, There's a we, lot going on. We yeah, started, started the day, and uh, I... I made the mistake of wandering uh, to go s see how Bagani was doing this morning, and then I got I got locked into doing uh, registration for all of the league events because oh, we no. had a line out the door for that, which was awesome. Um, so I got to meet a lot of people and basically give them the same spiel about how they get their cool prize tickets that we just talked about. Yeah. Um, so that took until, I mean, I think we had a line until about 9, 10 or something. Oh, and then okay. I wandered over. Uh, I, I saw like I saw the event for Legion start the the LCQ started like 7:30 7:30 reg and got started I think you guys kicked off right. at like 8 8:30 or something 8:30 okay 8:30 was for LCQ so yeah. so yeah so I saw I saw the players like filtering in I've seen some gonk racing I've seen so I've walked the hall a little bit 
But I've been basically running back and forth between different spots. I just came back over from uh, the Armada section yep. and and talking with those guys over there. So, so I've seen I've seen speckles of games, but it won't be, probably be until Saturday where I can just like be free to wander around and stare over people's shoulders and really, a little. yeah, and start yes. you know start really getting in on their miniatures. That's cool. My favorite thing to do is walk over to a tournament table and just start picking things up and be like, "This is amazing! Oh, it's so cool!" And then put them back, back just randomly. <laughs> I don't do that, but it would be funny. What, what do you think makes uh, Legion well, unique and why, why it's popular? What, obviously, you would come from a game design yeah, yeah. perspective because it obviously has many unique points to it. What do you think is the big one for it, though? I mean, you know, obviously, I think the first thing that draws people in is, is Star Wars, right? Yep. Like, seeing, seeing something that's multi-generational and as just um, evocative of people's imaginations as Star Wars... Like, right away, you know what a Stormtrooper is. You can recognize Luke Skywalker. You know what Darth Vader is. You know what clone troopers look like. So I, I think that's the first thing. But I think what really, you know, Star Wars can only take you so far. And then I think what really what really hooks people in um, and, and kind of, like, keeps them in the game or gets them motivated to go with the game, I think it's the, for me, there's a couple of pillars of what makes Legion Legion. One is the command card hands. And how yeah. the construction of that hand and the way in which you play it throughout the course of the game has so much impact and can lead to big play opportunities. It's extreme. Like, it, it can make or break your game, absolutely. Yeah. That's what makes uh, Vader and Luke so strong mm -hmm. still is their command hand. They have yeah. six each, and, and they're great kits for both of them. Yeah, 100% agree. And, and knowing when you want to try to hard go for priority versus what you might lose in terms of your order allocation... Yeah. Uh, and potentially, you know, if you're playing a, a one pip for um, one of your characters or you've built your character's command cards around, like, what they can do, those those things all impact. So you can say, okay, well, I know I have to go first, but then I'm not going to have order control because my one pip that's left, you know, it only gives me one order typically. Like, so I'm going to be drawn off the top of my stack. Yeah. What does that mean? And that, that leads into the second pillar, which is the order stack, right? The yeah. idea that your activations are not completely in your control, but through either clever use of uh, assigning orders or army construction, you can kind of mitigate some of that. Um, so I think those puzzles and those challenges start to bring things in. And then last, and then, you know, the last part, which may be the most important part for a lot of people, because you asked from like a game design and perspective, like for me, those two things are the things that I think really make Legion stand out from other games that I've played. And I've played a lot of games. Yeah. But those are the, those are the unique mental challenges. And when you get to the table and you say, okay, these are the things I have to think about and they, and they matter. You have all the classic miniature stuff, you know, positional elements, where am I deploying, where am I moving my forces, how are the objectives forcing me to, like, react to my opponent, what is my opponent doing to place pressure on me, how am I putting pressure on my opponent. But, you know, that order stack, that command deck, I think those are really unique. And then, of course, I think you have the, the theme of Star Wars, right? The, yeah. the, the, the places where that, that flavor can really come through, largely in the characters because yeah. they're obviously more expensive so they can do more stuff. But I think even when you look at some of like the through lines of, you know, Mandalorians being immune to Pierce because they have the Beskar armor, um, things like uh, Jedi um, and how the lightsabers are kind of thematic with the Pierce, um, and uh, and that kind of those kinds of things, right? I think I think those things. There's when you play, you can see Star Wars on the table. You can feel the movies playing out, and I and I think there's a lot of games out there that. You know, they struggle with hitting that theme. And our goal at Atomic Mass, especially since kind of like taking the reins on these games and building off of the foundations from them, has always been very focused on, okay, how do we get more Star Wars into the game? How do we get more narrative? Yeah. How do we get more theme into, the, into these units, into these ideas? Um, and it's a unique, you know, it's a unique challenge when you're talking about something like Legion because Legion uses a universal keyword system. So... At, at bare bones, when you deconstruct a character, when you deconstruct a unit, you say, okay, well, it's really just made up of these same rules that are on these same things. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. it's the combination of how those rules work that can create theme and flavor. Sometimes you can make new ones, but there's always that danger of if you continue to add universal rules to the cards, you don't actually have universal rules because... <laughs> You can only support so many before it's like, well, everyone has a unique rule, but they're all universal. <laughs> they could share at some point, but they don't. But they don't ever, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, so I think, you know, that's the other thing, right, is that it takes these elements, these, these really cool army game elements of command and control, combines them with some really good Star Wars, the Star Wars look, and then a lot of Star Wars, hopefully a, a growing amount of Star Wars flavor, and it creates an experience 
that makes you feel like you're playing out the movies, that it feels like you're in the general seat and you know, you're, you're enacting some of these big battles. That's cool. You've segued quite nicely into, number f into the, like, the next question, really, <laughs> which was like, when you're uh, thinking what to create next in the game, uh, how long does it go from initial concept to fruition? Yeah, so I mean, so the, the process actually is, if we're talking about initial idea to final thing, um, it could be as long as five years. Wow. Because. Wow. Whoa. Um, I, I was not. Was yeah. Well, so, and, and, and really what that means is, is that we, we plan a minimum of five years ahead. My yeah. job is to have a roadmap, to that know where sense. we want to go, to have an idea of like, how are we going to get there? And because you have to structure, you know, the way in which these lifestyle games grow, the way in which it, one unit can impact the entire meta versus a faction, how are you growing these factions in ways that are offering players new opportunities, that are pushing boundaries of the meta and keeping the game experience fresh, exciting players and their imaginations, letting them innovate. There's a lot of stuff to it, right? So you have to have a long-term view of, I think this is where we're going. Now, just because we have an idea at a mark and we have a five-year plan, it doesn't mean that five years from now, yeah. we've, we've like, com like it's not a solid map. It's, an, it's a general, like, we think we're going in that direction, Yep. right? But we might yeah. veer left or right, depending on what's going on. So five years is about the idea. Like, we have ideas out from five years, and we say, we think these are the things we're going to make. Now, there might be a piece of Star Wars media or an opportunity with LFL that comes in, and it's like, yeah. okay, well, we're going to shift. Um, when the work really starts is two years. It's a minimum of two years to create hard plastic miniatures with all the rules, with all the art. Like that's our timeline, and it's okay. very immutable. Um, you can shave some months off here and there, but it requires doing things that we don't like to do unless there's a really good reason to do it. So we've built everything around the fact that, you know, two years we can make what we believe are the best miniatures and the best rules that we possibly can. Yep. And so here's what we're going to do. So those ideas, once we get in that two-year cycle, you know, from that point, it becomes less of an idea, and we start making a concept. We say, okay, this is what it's going to do. This is how it's going to fit within the general army or right. within the faction, or this is what it's going to add to the game. These are the design beats for development to hit. This is the art that we're going to need. These are the kind of, like, cards that we envision needing, yeah. the, whether it's command cards, upgrades, unit stuff, whatever. And from that point, you know, we start really banging out everything. And so development starts, development gets basically about 18 months um, or more, depending on kind of what the complexity of the thing is. Sculpting starts right away. So sculpting and development are kind of working concurrently. And there's a lot of cross-checking where it's like, okay, if the concept says he's gonna have like, you know, the DC-15 long blaster, uh, if it's a clone, clone unit or a clone character or whatever, then if development suddenly changes their mind or sculpting suddenly changes their mind on something, they have to communicate that to make sure right. that it gets reflected in the rules if it matters or whatever. Like, this character is going to be equipped with X, Y, and Z. Okay, well, the sculptors need to know that. And if the sculptors are like, well, why doesn't work because of these reasons, yep. then development either goes, okay, well, we'll just kind of hand wave it that it's there or we'll remove it and come up with a new idea. Um, artwork happens typically after the sculpting or uh, after the sculpting stage is, is in process because it takes a little less time. And then once we have all these elements together, our amazing graphic design team has to get has to get them all and then create them into products. Right? They have to lay out the cards, they have to Man. lay out the packaging, they have to do all the photography. So it really doesn't become a thing that players get to have until they're done with it. And then by that point, it then we then send it off to Asmodee, who is our publisher. So we as the studio actually don't manufacture anything. Yep. Um, we create all of the files and all of the things they need, uh, and then we turn it over to the publisher to create. So you think, like, a great example is kind of like how old school record companies used to work, yeah. where the band, we make the music, but they print the records. Oh, no, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got this cool and, album. <laughs> yeah, and so, and so, you know, even though we're done with our work at that point, the real work of manufacturing and production happens, and that's a consistent process with them. Uh, back and forth as they work on getting the things actually made, actually manufactured. We have to have a lot of conversations about tooling and how the factory is going to cut the different parts, yep. how the mold layouts are going to be. Um, we do a lot of proof checking, and then eventually it gets on a boat. And then provided that you know there aren't somebody shooting rockets at people across canals or anything, the boats wind up getting to places, and we release on a global on a global release date. That makes sense. Okay. On a sort of a follow up to that development thing is. It You've got so the, the the miniatures have changed drastically. The plastics changed also. Then you and, and then it's changed in terms of the sculpt. Mm -hmm. Where, 
the feedback from the community that has been like pretty po very positive. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And what, so I recall last year's stream concept stuff coming out, so the the, mm -hmm. the future stuff as well. How long? Is that, where is that, how long does that sort of take to sort of design an in intricate mini miniature? I'm not a graphic designer, I'm not a designer. How long does it, like a sculptor from? Like the sculpts? From sculpts to think, do they have to like design it, make an initial, see how it looks and then go from there? Is it, I'm yeah, not, uh, so, the, so the sculpting process to get to miniatures is, um, it's interesting, it usually like to go from a sculpted, or like from a miniatures concept to a final like in stores miniature yeah. is about 18 months. Okay. Um, and with, with a large amount of that being like production and tooling and stuff. But effectively what happens is, is that uh, the way a miniature is birthed is the like art team, yeah, the art team under Dallas will create a concept. So he and I, Dallas and I will work together and we'll say, okay, this is the thing that it's supposed to be. So I will pull reference from the LFL archives, we'll identify, you know, this is the costume, this is the equipment that they're supposed to have, this is all this. And that concept goes to both developments and to uh, the designers and the miniature sculptors. That's cool. From there, Dallas and the art team will start sketching out poses. So if it's a single character, we'll have a smattering of poses. We'll say, we like this one for the character because we think it looks great. It's going to look really good in miniature. If it's a unit, we'll have a number of them. So we like, guy doing this, guy doing this, guy doing this, right? Yeah. right? right. And you'll pick those. From there, that concept gets sent to Marco, who leads the sculpting uh, team. Uh, he works with a great guy called Mike Jones who is the uh, sculpting manager. He actually works with all of our freelance sculptors across the world. He sends out different jobs to all of them. And then the sculptors start working in their various uh, digital programs. Yep, yep. They'll turn over, so there's a lot of iteration that happens between Mike, uh, Marco, and everyone else, right? Eventually, when they believe that that job is final, it comes back to the studio. We print it out as a 3D prototype. And then a number of us sit down in person, and we have what's called a cam. And during the cam, we're actually reviewing the 3D printed sculpt. And the reason that's so important is because when you look at something on a screen, whether it's a photograph or a three-dimensional CAD modeling program, you're only seeing it in two dimensions. Yeah. Like yeah. the CAD program cheats, and it, and it does things to make it look 3D on the screen, but it's not. And so the only way you can really tell if something is sculpted correctly to the scale is by seeing it in person. And there's a thing like that people don't notice, which is as you start to shrink things, certain proportions have to be adjusted yep. for the eye to read it properly. So for example, if you take a miniature, if you take like a miniature stormtrooper or whatever, and you blew it up to real proportions, you'd be like, oh my gosh, that thing's hands are insane. You know, the hands would be the size of somebody's <laughs> like head. The, the head itself would be like a bobble head. Yep. But it's because as you start to shrink things down, the eye needs these certain cues and it needs these certain distortions in order to read properly. Did not know that. So yeah, the either. fact of the matter is, is that when you look at something, you say, that miniature looks amazing. It's so proportional. When you look at it on screen or if you blow it up into anything that doesn't show it at accurate scale, the proportions are off. Wow. The eyes are way bigger. Like They all look like gray aliens because their eyes are super huge. You have all these different <laughs> accounts that you have to do for this stuff. And so... So we have this cam, and that's when we're looking at the thing in 3D, and we say, okay, this needs to change proportionally. This is too big. This isn't reading right. We don't like this pose, or it's obscuring this. This isn't printing properly. And so it goes through a process. That's not done by the sculptor. That's done by our engineering team. And oh, our engineering cool. team is really, they are the secret heroes that make everything possible. Because you can have the best sculptor in the world, but the fact of the matter is, is that their sculpt is probably not going to be manufacturable. Yep. So the engineering team goes in, they adjust all of the different, they adjust all the different proportions, they do all the final tweaks, they make the thing as, as perfect as it can be based on the original sculpt. And then they go through the process of working at the factory to determine, okay, this is how we're going to part it, this is how we're going to cut it, we have to remove this detail here for undercuts, all these different considerations. That whole process takes about four to five months. And then by that oh, point, wow. it goes off to the factory, and the actual manufacturing and tooling process starts, and we, and we do all yeah. that. We get shots back, we check the shots, we make sure they fit together. If they don't, we have notes to the factory. So it's, it's a very long and intensive process, and it's part of the reason why we've really carved out that two years is the minimum. Yep, that makes um, sense. So when we do things like roadmaps and stuff, you know, like the roadmap we're gonna have on Sunday, um, where we're gonna show off a bunch of things, that stuff typically is all within a, a calendar year. It's, we're usually only showing stuff about 12 months out. Yep. Because at that point, we're very confident in the fact that it's gone to manufacturing, that we know that there's not gonna be any major hiccups. And, and it's to a point to where you know, we can show it in a way that people are gonna be like, what is this nonsense that you're putting on the screen? So it was this time last <laughs> It was, the, actually, it was Adepticon last year. It was Bad Patch revealed, wasn't yep. it? And yep. yeah, that's it. Now take the next one. 
Our next question. Let's yeah, see. Uh, Bang. How frequently might we see balance changes going forward? Um, kind of like yearly or six months mm -hmm. or? So, um, you know, I think we talk a little bit about this at our mini extravaganza panels or just in general. Our, our desire as game designers and developers, right, is to have as minimal impact as possible on the meta and the community. Yep. Uh, to have on the games because every change you make has a ripple effect oh, absolutely. that can massively yeah. affect other things. And so every every time you go in and adjust something, even if that thing looks clearly broken, the reality of the situation is is that you may have unintended consequences that cause a bigger problem down the line. It's so hard to predict. And when you consider the fact that we are balancing and playtesting new releases that are two years in development, against things that as they live now, right? We don't know if we're going to make an errata change or a yeah. balance change until we make that determination, right? So there are things that are currently in print that we can't change that may be affected by an errata change that could be catastrophic, that could have yeah. a game-breaking effect. Yeah. So every time we make a change, we have to say, okay, well, what what is unchangeable? How does this affect different things? With that in mind, we're very hesitant to go in and make and have like a regular schedule. We do we're constantly reviewing things. We're constantly taking in community feedback, looking at tournament results, looking at community chatter, talking to our playtesters, talking to our judges, talking to members of the community that, that have a good sense of what's going on, talking to our retailers and everything else, right? We want to take as much data in as yeah, possible yeah, yeah. And, then, and then kind of consolidate and determine, okay, these are, the, these are the items that are hot right now. We'll watch them. We want to see if the community can solve them. A lot of the times when things come out, it's just somebody in the community hasn't innovated a way to beat it yet. Yep. And that's knee-jerk reactions are not only bad because of their unintended consequences, but they also can be bad because if you're always coming to the rescue, quote unquote, of the community because something is currently dominating or strong arming the meta, you're you're denying the players the opportunity to find the tools that yeah. exist in the box to solve it. Now that doesn't that doesn't mean that I like believe that there's always a solution. Sometimes there's not. Sometimes we make mistakes. Right. We as game developers are not perfect. And the, the reality of the situation is, is no matter how much we test, no matter how hard we work, we can't replicate in two years yeah. what the community can do in a month. Because the community right. is global. It's yep. huge. It's, it's massive. Huge. Um, and so our goal as, as kind of like what we try to do is make sure that everything is as locked down as possible and then we release it into the world and we see how it organically grows. And most of the time, we're pleasantly surprised by how people utilize things in different ways or think of different things. It's a long kind of answer to your question to say, we don't hold to a regular yeah. kind of update yeah. schedule. I don't see a world in which we would ever commit to a six month schedule yep. because it's just too fast. You wouldn't even know how the last six months changes affected the next six months changes, That's right? Fair. You can't even test within that period. A year itself is pretty tight yep. because like, how long does it take for people to reset their expectations to relearn like the errata balance adjustments and stuff? I, you know, overall, I think where we kind of wind up is like somewhere within that 18 month to 24 month cycle yeah. where it's like, we have enough data, we have enough knowledge, we have enough testing time to say we are very confident in what these things will do. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the reality of the situation is, is that we're moving into that point. Like when we took over, when we took over stewardships of the games, there were things that, you know, the community felt like needed to be addressed, we felt like needed to be addressed. We kind of have been working through that stuff. As we become more confident and comfortable with the game, so we, as we've kind of stepped fully into our role of working on these things, which I think we still have some space to go as well, um, and become more intimately familiar with these game designs, it's always hard to take over designs that are not your own, right? To, to learn and to think like other people thought. Oh, yeah. And, and so I think what, it, you know, what these last few years have been for us has been kind of a, okay, we understand or we're learning what the original intent of, you know, what the FFG designers did or what they were thinking, what this unit was supposed to do or maybe what it was aimed to do. We can see very well what that was. How would we have done it a little differently or we wouldn't have done it that way or maybe we have future plans. How do we want to expand? How do we kind of merge these two, right? How do we make a blended home in a way? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Because yeah. we're not, we are the step parent in some ways but we want what's best for the kid that, we, that we've that we taken in. We want to see them grow and thrive and be amazing, but we're not gonna do it exactly the same way. So how do we how do we make sure that, you know, we're balancing that against what the future comes from and what's gonna work best for us to take these games long-term into the thing? And and so we did, have a, we did have a number of adjustments, you know, we kind of worked off of the original Fantasy Flight 
um, release schedule, and they were very aggressive with kind of the points updates and stuff. And that was a mentality that was a little bit, you know, it was nerve wracking to us, especially at the time. But I think it was necessary to kind of move into that, and we've spaced them out more and more. And I think we're getting to a point now where comfortably, right, 12 months to me feels very aggressive for where the game is and, and how the state is and where we are with everything in our future plans. But obviously it's not that we're never gonna touch anything yeah. ever again, right? Uh, you always have to come in and tend the garden and you have to like, you have to trim some weeds back and if there's a major issue, we're obviously gonna solve it. Um, but I would say, you know, more than a year is the ideal, right? Like somewhere between 18 and 24 months, that's like, that's the minimum amount of time you wanna go to let a community breathe, to let to let new releases live, to let problems kind of be solved through organically. both organically yeah. through the community and also from testing on ourselves, right? Like I said, every single change you make has a dramatic impact. Yep. And the one thing that also from just a perspective of having a platform to talk about these things, right, is that I know a lot of the times when issues happen, right, they can feel from a player perspective, because I've lived it, I've been there, I've been a player for a lot of these games, right? When something doesn't work or it seems broken or there's a problem, you can your immediate reaction is they should just fix it and they should fix it this way. And even if the solution seems very clear, yeah. the reality is, is that it, there's more to it. But also, you know, the idea that we are our, our silence is indicative of the fact that we've accepted this problem as okay, or that we don't believe there's a problem, or we're not working on it, right? I, I want to assure everyone that that is just categorically untrue. We are constantly taking every bit of feedback and yeah. talking about it, big and small, to try to see is there val is there validity to it? Is this something that we need to like? We have a we have a we have a DefCon board at the office <laughs> where it's all these things that we've listed out, and we're and every week we're like, does it move up? Is this, are we at the point to where like this needs immediate address? I would love to be a fly on the wall for that. Uh, yeah, just Can to know what's just, on that wall. Yeah, just want to know what's there. <laughs> so that, I, I mean, literally it's, it's it's almost everything. Oh, okay, you know, yes. It, <laughs> it's because somebody somewhere has said something about every single thing in this game being unfair, overpowered, broken, whatever, uh, not good enough. You know, that also gets on the board. This thing is just so terrible, no one will take it. Okay, do we need to do we need to bounce around it to bring it up? I think I think every player can sit and say, I've got an idea about something to change. Yeah. I, I know oh, I yeah. can, I know you can. Oh, yeah. Everyone probably can say, I would do this, I would do that. Someone might say, oh, Pathfinder. Someone might say, Rebel Core or whatever. Mm -hmm. it, everyone's got an idea of what they think would be, the perf would be their perfect world mm -hmm. in that sense. Yeah. And, and and all of those things, right? Like if it's if it's a piece of data that gets spoken into the world and we can find it, yeah. again, whether it's a retailer talking about it, whether it's here at a convention talking about it, whether it's online, you know, any place, the dev team is voracious for data, right? They can never have enough data. And so it all it kind of all winds up yeah. on the board. That's a lot cool. of it doesn't get brought up, you know, every week, but it's all there. So that board is just it's kind of everything in a way. You've, we've segued quite nicely into the, into the penultimate sort of question, really. So when you design the new stuff, uh, when you design units for each faction, do you, uh, well, obviously you will, but like how big a part is faction identity mm -hmm. a part of that, i.e. the Republic, share. The share all the stuff, and defensive tech or whatnot, and the red saves. Um, the separatists, order control, that sort of thing. And where... Um, and if you do, what do you see as the... Uh, when you do, sorry what do you see as the identity for Rebels and Empire? Sure. Because it's like they do everything, whereas mm -hmm. the other two have a fit. What do you, what do you think, or what, what, how do you design them in that head? Yeah, so, so I think there's, like, there's a couple of different, there's some, there's some mixing going on in your question, right, from my point of view. Absolutely fine. So like token sharing and like AI, right, um, or droid, droid rules for the Separatists, those are mechanics that do separate them and they're things you have to consider they're not necessarily the identities of oh, those okay. factions, right? Like I would say, so they are things, like those two things specifically because they're there are absolutely things you have to design around. You have to be aware of token sharing because yeah. it can completely blow out a unit's power level. Absolutely. And we've seen it, right? We've seen Rick's how out. problematic that rule has been just based on the number of times it has been toned down or addressed in some way. Mm -hmm. um, so we do take into the, those things into account. But I think when you talk about faction identity, it, it's larger than just a mechanic or a shared kind of through line on a universal thing. Like for us, right, when we look at faction identity, what we're looking at is, you know, we're saying, okay, 
what is it to be, what is it to play Galactic Republic? What, what are the big notes that players want out of that? And for us, you know, what we've identified for Galactic Republic is it's an elite army. They're typically outnumbered, but they have kind of the best of the best. Red saves is a great example of that. Like most Republic units will have red saves because there aren't that many of them, but they are well equipped. They are the yep. elites, right? They're bred, they're cloned and trained for war uh, and it's all they know. And they, they can kind of rely on the best of equipment, but they're typically going to struggle against higher activation lists, right? Um, they're, they're not going to attrition super well, so once that attrition ball starts rolling, it's going to be a more uphill battle for them because there's just not as many of them on the table. And so once you have those kind of ideas in there, and then, of course, you have the, like, the idea of brotherhood, right? You want to see clones working together. You want to see every clone should care about every other clone. Yeah. You want to feel that connectivity between those units. That's kind of the token sharing thing. Yeah. That's the idea behind it. Um, and then, of course, you have Jedi, right? What is a Jedi? How does that work? They get to take. They have access to the most Jedi, the most Force users. Um, how do you play into that? I know there's like a bell going on it's right a now. It's a bicycle. It's wild. Just literally yeah, riding it's, behind it's me. It's the in a minute. beer cart. Oh, oh, is it a beer cart? Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. There you go. So, so then you take those things and you say, okay, how do how do those influence like what unit choices? How do we? How do we work around, because part of faction identity, identity is about their strengths, but also their weaknesses. Yeah. So if, they're, if they have low activation count, how, what are the tools that you can give them to mitigate that? What are some of the things you can do that make that, make that necessarily not go away, because then everything's the same, but how do you do things that will allow them to compete in ways that are meaningful, that give players options and opportunities? And in those things, you can often find how to create new meaningful units that add value, right? Um, wh whatever those may be, or new upgrade cards, or new command cards, things like that. Separatists, we look at, like for me, the faction I did the Separatists, is, they're kind of like the Star Wars undead army. They're, it's, you play them like these hordes of endless like rank and file troops that just grind you down. Yep. They're yeah. terrible on their own. Like, <laughs> like a child could beat one of them, but a child <laughs> can't beat 10 of them, right? the old right. question of how many, how many how toddlers? Many, how many toddlers and how many yeah. ducks do you reckon it'll take before you lose? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so when we're looking at that, right, it's it's always a question of, you know, they're going to have the lower lower stats, but they're always going to have this numerical superiority. They do have, you know, higher grade units like IG units and, and things like that, but the programming is really unique. Like, how does the AI system play in? These are obviously rules mechanics that get expressed. But then you have the idea of like the you know the super tactical droids or the the leaders of the separatist army being kind of like the necromancers. How do they how do they enhance the droid army? And these some of these concepts I'm talking about we haven't really seen yet. So but these are the ideas that are going through our head. So like how do we integrate you know talking about going back to that blended home and where we're going in the future? How do we get more of this faction identity out of them? Yeah. How do we start to really diverge these factions and this game into a way where every faction has a very unique feel? Right. And and one that is indicative of what a player who comes to the game like would want to play. I want to play the elites. I love the clones because they're bonds of brothers yeah. and they, they have the best of the best. I want to play the droids because I want to crush my enemies under this merciless like machine of droids. And the droids deficiencies are made up for either in quantity or through their AI systems. Uh, a little bit of this comes through in the experimental droids battle yes. force, right? The, the whole concept of the idea of the super tac droids being able to spend these tokens to enhance the abilities of their things, it goes back again to feeling like, okay, how does, how does a necromancer make his skeletons better? He uses a little bit of necromancer magic and he <laughs> empowers them and stuff. Yep, yep, yep. So it's the Star Wars kind of equivalent of that because I think that's what you see when you watch those big battles on screen and stuff, that's what you see. Talking about the Rebels faction identity, you know, for us, it's really about, okay, so the Rebels are a scrappy group that's not coordinated, so they don't have great order control. They can't really rely on generals. They don't have a lot of heavy equipment. But what do they have? They have grit and gumption, right? They have a belief. And, and so what that means is, is that, you know, I think you see this a little bit in the fact that the Rebels have, you know, traditionally their, their blaster rifles are better, black dice versus white for the stormtroopers. Um, they typically are very survivable. They, they're cagey. They know how, how and when to strike and fade. Um, so playing into kind of those ideas like that, that kind of, that subterfuge, sabotage, dodgy, um, but uh, a force that, well, it has a belief in something, when pinpoint pressure is applied to it, it will kind of crack and it will start to fall apart. Yeah, yeah. 
right? It's it can't survive a strong grind because each rebel knows that their best bet is to run away to live to fight another day, right? They're not going to win. They're not going to win the galaxy in one engagement. Um, and then you have the empire, right? The empire is very command and control, and and you talk about how the imperial officers, the leaders of that army, are so critical because unlike the clones who have this personal initiative and this belief that they have a brotherhood with each other and they're trained to kind of be these elite soldiers yep. that can operate without the overseer of a Jedi, the Empire is all about obedience, right? So a stormtrooper... I like the way you went. Yeah, like that. The same time. <laughs> we know. Um, so a stormtrooper by himself is not going to know what to do. They're, they are trained in a way that they will not deviate from orders. And so you talk about like, okay, you know, Imperial officers are the backbone of the, Imper of the Imperial Army because without them, a stormtrooper is going to be like, well, the, my last order was to stand here yeah. and that's what I'm going to do because <laughs> if I don't do it, someone's going to choke me to death <laughs> with the force, right? But they also have access to, you know, they have access to the best heavy equipment so they have a lot more vehicles and tanks and their tanks should be of quality compared to other things. Um, they have, you know, they have a number of elite troops and so the backbone of their forces, well, okay. The, unlike the Republic where their elites are centered in their core units, for the Empire, their elites are centered in their special forces, are centered in their like support choices yeah. and things yeah. like that, right? Yeah. And so it, you get kind of this, this inverse mirror of the Republic and it, you play a little bit off of that where like personality and personal initiative and trusting in the common soldier to be the best is the Republic version. The Empire version is kind of the opposite. Common soldier doesn't get to make any decisions. It doesn't get to do anything without it. Has no personal initiative. We rely on our, our specialized units and our Imperial doctrine to give us the needs to go over. And trying to play in more of that and to see more of that in, in those factions and how does that play into like units like range troopers or some of the other things that we've seen, dark troopers for instance, um, being a really unique one where we kind of got to flex our ideas behind how the Imperial units would really work in, a, in this kind of microcosm of things that are going on. Um, so that, that kind of comes down to like kind of the identities that the greater identities narratively and thematically that we see and, and we really want to work towards while also making sure that the game maintains, you know, it's really great balance level and where it is right now. That makes sense. A follow up for that one. Community question this one. Mm -hmm. Major, major importance. I, I got you. I'm ready. Gungans. Question mark. <laughs> Gungans question mark. Well, there's a lot of ways to answer that one. Um, the, the, I think it's like, I, I, I think they're wondering where they are. Where they are? <laughs> oh, they're located in Naboo, but they live underwater, so they're pretty hard to find. Like, all their cities are hidden. Of course, that's it. Yeah, so, that's so, so yeah. you got to be able to swim really well. <laughs> so, yeah, no, but yes, that was, that was a, uh, that was a I community mean, question. Uh, yeah, so. I, think, I think as far as, you know, I, we, all, we obviously we see a lot of chatter for Gundan, Gungans, uh, Mandalorians, and things like that. I, one of the really, you know, one of the things that was so exciting, one of the very first things we did and worked on was, uh, you know, the... The, the finishing up of Shadow Collective. Um, and one of the developmental choices that we made as we were taking that product and those products across the finish line is that we reimagined what the scum and villainy faction as it had appeared in X-Wing yep. uh, could be. And we turned it into this idea of mercenaries. And then utilizing battle forces, we were able to take these mercenaries that now could have value to multiple different factions that the standard factions, but also then combine them into these thematic and very specific groups. Um, and that's important because, well, Legion is a player choice game, right? You, you can construct your army however you want within yeah. the rules. You can have things happen. You can have the Empire, you know, fight the Separatist Alliance. You can have Darth Vader fight Dooku. These things never happen in media and they never will. They're not canon, but we can do them on the tabletop. Yeah. The reality of the situation is, is that we are still, as game designers and developers, beholden to respecting the canon, to presenting things in a way that could be canonical. So even though you have the choice to play Legion any way you want, we have also made sure that the, the foundations of being able to play the game to the truth of the media, of the movies, is there. So like a custodian. Yeah, yeah. in a way. 
Um, and that's really important because there are people who want to express that, right? They want to play the game more historically. They want to see that. But it also shows, it also grounds, I think, the whole game experience in a way that's really important because it makes it feel real like Star Wars. If, if you go too far out of those bounds, it starts to feel less like, well, less what Legion wants to be, which is the very grounded, like gritty, realistic kind of world of Star Wars warfare, right? Um, it's not the it's not the carefree laissez-faire kind of Saturday morning cartoon feel that Shatterpoint has, where today's enemy can be tomorrow's allies, and at the end of the day, no matter how bad it looks, though you know those characters have survived to show up next yep. week. Um, right. So, so with that, right, with Star Wars, there are consider or with Legion, there are considerations and things we want to be sure to be careful of. For example, you know the idea that you could play an entire rebel army of Ewoks. The Ewoks never left off-world, right? The, the Ewoks' alliance with the Rebel Alliance was very temporary and it was very exclusive to Endor. So player choice-wise, right, it would have been very difficult to do Ewoks in the game in a way that wouldn't have broken the canon in ways that would yeah. have been kind of difficult or weird to work around. But using the mercenary, the mercenary rule and the, and the battle force rules, we can let you play that Ewok army but ground it more into the narrative and the and the story of the canon yeah. while also giving you the choice as a player to say, well, I want to take some Ewoks in my army because Ewoks are cool and then I'm going to pair them up with my Wookiees and I'm going to have like... Ball of fur. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the, the army of fur. Fur force. And uh, fur force nine specifically, sir. <laughs> um, so, so that gives us the flexibility. And the reason that I bring all that up is because that opened up everything in terms of like what what LFL and us can agree to do, what can be brought into this world. And so Gungans, I think, are very, very possible in the future based on the idea that, you know, Gungans did work with the Galactic Republic, but they were never official part of that army. Yeah, yeah. So much like Ewoks, right, there needs to be a way to canonically represent that and how the Gungans interacted within the canon of the story versus in the, you know, the story and the narrative of Legion itself as a game. And we have that. Yeah. And so the roadmap is there. Ewoks have shown it. Shadow Collective has shown it. Gungans, I have no doubt at some point we will see we will see the bombad general Jar Jar <laughs> leading his troops to glorious victory on the tabletop. It's just a matter of time. Yeah, right? that makes sense. Gungan mercenaries. John, let's do go. you have any other business questions to follow up? I've got two little tiny ones, but that's about it. No, let's hear it. So the two tiny ones are one, anything you can spoil for us? Oh, I can spoil everything for you, but you've got to be <laughs> that was in me, Nirvana. That was, that was me, bro, the yeah. cheeky British guy. Going, it's got to be. It's it, got to be in, it. in Nirvana at noon on Sunday, oh. and all with, the secrets will be revealed. I can deal with that. Actually, you guys are going to get quite the spoiler uh, tomorrow when they hand out the participation prize card for uh, Legion Worlds. Boom. That's good okay, to know. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, and the other one, I forgot what the other one was because that's that was it, really. That was it. I <laughs> that mean, was pretty much it. <laughs> you got to close with spoilers, right? That's Obviously. just how it works. Yeah, yeah. That's how it works. <laughs> try, try some journalistic approach. You go, spoilers, anyone? That sort of thing. And uh, no, but um, well, thank you very much for joining us. Absolutely. Fully aware you are about to go behind me and go I see am. the guys over there. I'm go pop over and see professional casual as I make my little stream circuit. Nice. Are you? Actually, I remember what my last question was. Are you willing to put a little thing and go? Uh, a unit that might win, uh, something, a force that might win, or a list that might win in the, in the, the worlds. Oh, do I have to pick oh. a list? No, pl not a player, but like a, a type a list? of list you think that might be the a the faction champion. or an archetype. Well, I, I mean, we got a pretty, we got a pretty good, we got a pretty good dark horse last year with the whole Black Suns and uh, Black Suns list. It was the pink horse. It, the pink horse, <laughs> yes. I would say Lila will. I'll, she'll like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I. I'll chuck mine for you, and if it helps, it trigger. Yeah, yeah. I think a well-piloted triple ATST Tempest. Oh, you think Tempest? I think just have a sneak suspicion if it's well-piloted and it's a triple ATST variant, not the trooper variant. Okay. Because it techs well into uh, the exper experimental droids, mm -hmm. which a lot of tier one players are trying. I'll tell you from from my from my personal heart, like mm -hmm. what my personal heart would love to see. I would love to see the ascension of the 501st because it's it's had oh, glimmers yeah, of greatness yeah. and I love an underdog. Uh, and and I think and I think and I think we've seen how powerful that list can be in the right hands yep. even with its lower activation count. I don't know if there's enough. I don't I don't know if even the greatest skill is enough to get it over the hump of this level of competition. It's a lot. But I would love to see it. So I would the, love to see it because so I love the 501st. A sneak, well, not a sneak, a, a 
reaction from World Team Championships that took place in Spain in January. 501st when it ended playing the 14 activation Ewok lists led by the French, who won the tournament, didn't fare because the activation count, they just went, well, I'll, you're going to kill them, and it took you so long, even with Sharpshooter from Arcs. Mm -hmm. They were managed to sneak around. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was so. Uh, lots of people obviously tech into the 14, 14 Ewoks. Yep. It's an interesting one. I'm loving it because I love. I love there's no one list that anything can do yeah. anymore. So yeah. It's so much yeah. fun. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. Absolutely. Uh, I'll I'll stick my head into your little section every once in a while and cause problems. Thank you very That's much. That's what I do. <laughs> thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you. Right. And that was Will Schick. Uh, chat thank you very much for joining us uh, i hope you've had lots of reactions out i'm going to look through the all chat right, a bit i'll hand you your seat back thank you thank you so much see you around thanks for all your hard work i know that yeah. this is not easy to do oh it, it's <laughs> a pleasure no, honestly it. it's a pleasure to do to be honest it's having so much yeah. fun and it's all good yeah. Yeah. um thanks for giving me your seat awesome well, of course, so like zane's having a chat john first reactions on things gungans. from the interview gungans might be something oh gungans are definitely else. Gungans are definitely in the pipeline. I think that's that, what I got from that interview. I, I, yeah, I got like, because they would. So we had to send them the questions in advance. So some of them obviously say, please don't do that. It's fine. Right. The, the fact the Gunga one stayed in. Ooh, interesting. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the. Well, do you know what? That's game. That's uh, day one of not day one. That's, uh, that's round two. Round of two, day first one. half of LCQ. Yeah, two games down. Uh, I've already lost count. Eight, thirteen, eleven to go. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And we still and we still have the power of retaining our voices. And and we've got a dancing, dancing. Zane. Hey, already is. Hey, on. Who invited me on? Um. Anyway, Zane. Welcome back, mate. Yeah. Thank you for sacrificing your chair. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Camera, oh, you're padding, that's why. <laughs> I wonder, like, what's going on? Camera's falling. I'm going to say hello to Ollie while you have a chat. All right. All right, are we going to cut stream here? Because they're going to restart round. They're going to oh, put man. pairs up here in just a little bit. So. Yeah. All right, chat. Uh, hang in tight. Log back in in, like, two minutes. We're yep. just going to close the stream and reopen it to... Yep, just so we can we can save our uh, our video here. So All right. we will be back in just a second. Just